speaker is Stephen Preston of the University of Colorado, who will talk about fed homeness of Riemannian exponential maps on diffeomorphism groups. Hi. Um, so the uh, main example that I'm going to talk about is the Euler equation for fluids, although most of these techniques, um, most of the results work anytime you have a similar sort of structure, so some sort of um, infinite dimensional group with a uh, Riemannian metric, which is right invariant, um, uh, which some of our speakers have talked about already. Uh, but the basic example is the Euler equation. Um, so as you've seen already, uh, ut plus del u u equals minus the gradient of the pressure, divergence-free vector field um, u. And the pressure is determined implicitly uh, by just taking the divergence of both sides, and so Laplacian p equals minus div del u u. Um, and what we mainly care about is not so much the Euler equation, uh, which is not so convenient for analytical purposes, uh, but rather the Lagrangian version of it, uh, which comes from looking at what fluid particles are actually doing. So fluid particles move according to the flow equation here, uh, eta t equals u composed with eta. Um, and so if you plug that in, uh, then eta t t is minus the gradient of the pressure composed with eta. Um, and so what you notice about this is, um, as Boris Kesson mentioned, uh, when you take eta t t um, and use the, the chain rule on here, uh, this term precisely reproduces this term. But what's nicer about the Lagrangian equation uh, is that it's an ordinary differential equation on an infinite dimensional space. What's going wrong up here is if I view this as uh, an equation for u in an infinite dimensional space, um, I lose derivatives in del u u. Right? So you have one fewer derivative if you view this as the right-hand side of the equation. Um, so you're losing derivatives. You can't make that ODE approach work. Uh, down here, you're not losing any derivatives. Um, essentially, what happens is this term involves loss of one derivative in u. It looks like 2, because you're taking derivative of u and then divergence. Uh, but actually, since it's u is divergence-free, you're only losing one derivative here um, in this term. You take the inverse Laplacian, you go back up to, and then you take the gradient to go back down. Um, and so as long as you're sufficiently smooth, uh, these compositions all uh, work out as an algebra. Uh, so the right side is exactly as smooth as eta and u, as long as things are sufficiently smooth. Um, so you want to use finite dimensional techniques. Can I, can I ask so yes. The notation doesn't fit with the, I mean, the whole thing. The so particles moving along is accelerated by the gradient of the pressure. Mm -hmm. So why do we have to, I mean, at each moment we compute the pressure from your implicit formula there. Uh -huh. so why do we have to move the pressure? Oh, it's... So it's actually easier to understand in terms of um, when you think of it geometrically. Uh, basically because um, so the acceleration is supposed to be tangent to the diffeomorphism group um, at whatever eta is. Uh, and it's only at the identity that um, those tangent vectors to the diffeomorphism group are actually vector fields on the manifold. Uh, normally, they're vector fields composed with the diffeomorphism. Right? So you've got to move the gradient of the pressure. Right. Um, is event that goes from the original coordinates. And pressure is right right so he, He's the speaker. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, moving on. The, so, the, the issue is um, you'd like to use as many finite dimensional techniques as possible because that, uh, you know, that's stuff we understand. Um, Euler equation is really hard to understand. Uh, so, the problem is you know, nothing ever quite works. So everything that works, you have to really force it to work. Um, so the even, an even nicer way to think about it, so I said it's an ODE uh, on an infinite dimensional space, but it's even nicer to think about it as a, a geodesic equation um, on an infinite dimensional space. Uh, and so the appropriate thing to use is the uh, group D mu M of volume preserving diffeomorphisms of whatever your Riemannian manifold is. Uh, and the Riemannian metric is given by this, and so the fact that the right side doesn't depend on eta is what makes the whole thing right invariant, um, which is convenient. Um, and so Arnold was interested in this because he wanted to understand stability of fluids, 
Uh, of course, from this point of view, you're going to understand Lagrangian stability. So you're going to understand, um, if you have some small perturbation of your fluid, uh, what happens to the particles? How do they move apart? Not so much Eulerian stability, which would be, um, if you have some small perturbation, how does the velocity change at some point? Um, they're related issues, but, but this is more convenient for Lagrangian. So we computed the curvature of this uh, diffeomorphism group, which um, is not super simple. It's um, mostly negative, but sometimes positive. Uh, so you can't say really nice things about, um, you know, use things like Cartan Hadamard or, or even say really precisely what's going to happen with, um, with your Lagrangian instability. Uh, ideally, in simple, if the curvature is really simple, then it tells you really simple things about uh, the Jacobi fields. If not, as in this case, um, it's really hard to make direct connections. So it's just kind of intuitive. Um, so the right invariant. Uh, Right invariant because the group operation is composition, um, and that's precisely where the conservation law comes from. So, so you get a lot of conservation, and so your second order geodesic equation is actually just a first order a system of two first order equations which are um, decoupled, uh, and that's what's convenient. So most people who are studying this um, from the PDE point of view would prefer to work with this equation because it's although it loses derivatives and although it's somewhat not nonlinear, it's not nearly as nonlinear as uh, this full equation. But from our point of view, uh, this one's the more convenient one to work with. Um, okay, so this is not the only equation it happens with, although this is the one that Arnold um, originally discovered, and then from there people used his techniques uh, to, get, to get this for other sorts of equations. Uh, the KDV equation uh, works out in the same sort of way. Kamasa Holm, which is um, another water weights equation, uh, works out. These equations are nicer because they're um, one variable, one space variable equations. So a little easier to understand things very concretely. Um, and so we can try to build local, find local existence. Um, so local existence of solutions should be a Riemannian exponential map, which we understand pretty well. Uh, global existence should be the hopf renault theorem. Can you extend a geodesic for all time? Um, stability, as I mentioned, you should be able to understand in terms of Riemannian curvature. Um, in general, the way this works, uh, in any situation, if you have a Lie group, right invariant metric, um, then the Euler equation is du dt plus add star uu. So the gradient of the pressure term is hidden in here for the Euler equation. Um, basically, it comes from the fact that you want this to be uh, divergence-free. So you throw in that gradient to make it divergence-free. Uh, and this is the... Um, in our case, it would be, on a diffeomorphism group, this would be a composition of the velocity field with eta, uh, but in general, it could be anything. Um, so the add star is uh, just defined by this adjoint on the group. Um, if you're on the diffeomorphism group, then add uv is the Lie bracket of your two vector fields uh, with a minus sign because of some convention. Um, so this is essentially what uh, Boris Kezin told you about um, from a slightly different perspective. Instead of on the uh, dual of the Lie group, we're just working directly on the um, the Lie algebra. Uh, so, very convenient is that you can essentially rewrite this as uh, this. Um, so the capital add star is, um, is well, capital add is the standard uh, adjoint operator of a group element acting on the Lie algebra. Add star is the metric adjoint of that. Um, and so this implies your conservation law, so you integrate this and you get vorticity conservation for fluids or um, other conservation laws if you have Kamasa home or KDV or something. Um, and so, of course, the essential difference, um, as, as you know, uh, is that in 2D, curl of U is a function. So this implies um, absolute conservation of this function. In 3D, just rewriting this, uh, implies that the vorticity uh, can stretch if D8 is, is stretching it. Um, and that's why 3D fluids are much harder than 2D fluids. Uh, so if you want, you can rewrite this stuff, incorporating this conservation law as um, just a first-order differential equation uh, if your initial velocity is fixed. And that'll be convenient uh, a little bit later. So what you have to watch out for is um, that although this gives you a nice picture of um, your continuum mechanics equations, uh, right. It's nice to look at things geometrically, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, it's only really useful if uh, some of these analytic difficulties work out. Um, so you can formally, for example, um, Boris Kezin and uh, 
Ovsienko worked out that the KDV equation was also a geodesic equation formally on the Botvira sor group, an extension of the diffeomorphism group of the circle. Um, and it doesn't quite work out in the, in the nice way where you say it's actually an ODE. Because right? essentially, you can use the same trick to get ut plus uux equal to eta tt, uh, but then you still have too many derivatives on this, so you don't have... Um, so what you want is you'd like to be able to write the equation in some way as um, dx dt equals f of x, uh, where f of x is some nice operator. Right? So you want it to be Lipschitz so you can use Picard iteration to get solutions. Um, and here the problem is uh, if you do that, the f of x, it's not even, it's not even a, a map of the space into itself. Right? Um, and you need more than that. You need a, a smooth dependence, and, or at least Lipschitz dependence. Um, so that's what you're worried about. Like if you if you if you start with u being say in some sublet space H S, uh, and then write this as a system of uh, on there, um, the function on the right hand side will be H S minus two, uh, or H S minus three. Um, so you'd like to avoid that because essentially the what what's going to go wrong there is um, although you can certainly prove existence of solutions for the KDV equation using direct PDE methods, um, you're not going to get smooth dependence uh, on the initial conditions like you would if everything was an ODE uh, in an infinite dimensional space. Another thing that goes wrong, especially if you care about stability, you care about computing curvature, uh, and the curvature is unbounded if you have something like this. Um, so if you're trying to understand things in terms of conjugate points, they don't behave anything like they do in finite dimensions. Um, so one of the Essentially, why this is happening is because the, the diffeomorphism group is not, is not a smooth Lie group. It's, so it's not a genuine Lie group. Um, the only time you get a, a genuine Lie group on the diffeomorphism group is if you assume everything C infinity. The problem with assuming everything C infinity is then you can't work with Banach space topology and Sobolev topology. Uh, so you don't get Hilbert space or, or Sobolev space, Hilbert space or Banach space. So nothing you want to prove really works out nicely in, a, in the Frege space of um, C infinity objects. Uh, so on the other hand, if you assume finite smoothness, then you're going to lose things like when you take the Lie bracket of two vector fields, it's not as smooth as those vector fields were originally. So all sorts of things are breaking down uh, for that reason. And the other reason things tend to break down is um, you need a sufficient degree of smoothness. So you need, uh, as Professor Schneelman said, at least uh, C1, preferably a little bit better than C1. Um, your Riemannian metric is only L2. So uh, it's not controlling any of the things you need for that group structure. Um, so you don't necessarily get a manifold. And so you have to deal with this fact that uh, what's generating your geometry is not the same thing as what's generating your manifold structure uh, and your ODE structure, therefore. So you don't really get anything for free. Um, anything you get where the infinite dimensional situation works like the finite dimensional situation, you really have to force into the problem or, or um, hope that something works out nicely for you. Um, and this is, so although this is true for the diffeomorphism group, it's also true in simpler cases. So probably something more intuitive um, if you're used to finite dimensional Riemannian geometry is to just try and extend it to infinite dimensional Riemannian geometry. Think of an ellipsoid. Um, in Hilbert space. So pretty much the simplest sort of uh, infinite dimensional Riemannian geometrical model. Uh, although this looks like just a toy model version because it doesn't, we don't really care about the geodesic equation on this space except just for fun, um, I'll actually show you uh, some connection later on. Um, but okay, so you take the space of square summable sequences and then you say um, choose some parameters so that uh, you consider an ellipsoid. If all the AK are one, then you're considering the round uh, infinite dimensional sphere. Um, and so if, you, if you're allowed to play around with these positive constants AK, uh, you can get various examples to contradict your finite dimensional intuition. Uh, so one thing is, for example, if you choose them in the right way, you can set it up so that there's no minimizing geodesic between the two antipodal points uh, on this ellipsoid. Uh, what's going to happen is you keep getting shortcuts every time you go into a, a new direction. Um, uh, yeah, you, so for all these examples, you assume that AK is bounded away from zero and um, from infinity. So generally, they're pretty close to one um, for what you need. Uh, 
also, if you study conjugate points on this uh, Riemannian manifold, um, in finite dimensions, uh, on a geodesic, you have finitely many conjugate points on any finite portion of it. Um, and if the, you consider conjugate points in terms of the differential of the exponential map, um, when the differential of the exponential map is not injective, then it's not surjective. And you get this you know, nice um, symmetry of conjugate points. All that falls apart in infinite dimensions. Um, so for example, you can get conjugate points, something approaching uh, the opposite. So normally the conjugate point happens in the antipodal point. Um, if you're allowed to change the AKs, then you can get a sequence of conjugate points converging to this location. Um, and so you have to distinguish between monoconjugate and epiconjugate, uh, which makes various things break down. If you'd like to try and understand the geometry of a space in terms of where conjugate points are forced to happen, um, all that stuff is going to break down in general. Uh, and other global stuff generally doesn't work as well. Hopfrino is the worst of the offenders. Um, it completely fails in infinite dimensions uh, in a variety of ways. So even if you have metrically complete, Hopfrino would normally imply that if your space is metrically complete, then you can extend any geodesic for all time, and you can get uh, minimizing geodesic between any two points. So neither of those things works, um, which is due to Atkin. Uh, and in fact, you may not even be able to get any geodesic uh, between two points, not just minimizing, but anything at all. Um, Morse index obviously fails in infinite dimensions because that depends on finiteness of conjugate points. Uh, one exceptional space um, where things do work is the free loop space, um, where this is the metric on the free loop space. Um, it actually satisfies hop no, metrically complete, minimizing geodesics, um, and the Riemannian exponential map is Fredholm. So Fredholm basically means uh, for nonlinear maps, you take the derivative, you look at the derivative as a linear map in, from one t uh, tangent space to another, uh, and if you can write it in the form invertible plus compact, that implies various things. So what most importantly, it implies that um, the kernel is finite dimensional. Um, and the co-kernel is also finite dimensional, and you get an index theorem, you can subtract them. Um, and so what happens here is, uh, so if you can prove Fredholm, then conjugate points can't cluster. You get finitely many uh, along any finite portion of a geodesic, and then you can start doing things with the infinite dimensional manifold. Uh, this theorem basically works because the curvature operator is compact, and so the hope was um, that maybe that's where you'd find Fredholmness in general. Uh, which turns out not to be true. Uh, no. Um, so there's, I, I guess there wouldn't really be an Euler equation directly because it's not right invariant, um, but I don't know what the geodesic equation is or if people have studied it. Um, do you know? Can't say. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't personally done anything with it. Um, okay, so we want to make this work for diffeomorphism groups um, because what we mainly care about uh, is hop for no, the, right? The, the famous unsolved problem for fluids is global existence of geodesics, right? And that's a, a part of the hop for no theorem. Um, so uh, if we try to Everything about hopfer breaks down uh, for the diffeomorphism group, as far as we know, and we don't know a whole lot about it. Um, so first of all, it's not metrically complete. Right? Um, so as a metric space, what's, so you get a distance induced uh, by minimizing length of geodesics. We, um, thanks to uh, Professor Schneerman, we know what that is in 3D, that it's not complete, and we know what the completion is, um, that essentially uh, right, our our diffeomorphisms are C1 um, objects, uh, and so there's nothing really preventing them from approaching um, things that are not C1 in the L2 metric, right? That doesn't control anything. Uh, and so you can actually reach anything you want that's L2 and volume preserving uh, in 3D. And we, we don't even know what it is in 2D. So that's like one of the rare cases where 2D is harder than 3D. Um, minimizing geodesics between, um, I guess, diffeomorphisms. Uh, existence of minimizing geodesics between two objects is unknown. Um, 
Generally, if you want that to happen, you have to allow for more general objects. Uh, and finally, like I said, um, the uh, famous unsolved problem is whether you have global existence of geodesics. We do know you have global existence in two dimensions, um, but not in three. Oh, um, that's my understanding. Peter Constantine um, related global existence for Euler and Navier-Stokes. Uh, and I think if you, um, so his result is if you have sufficiently small viscosity, then the global existence problem is, is equivalent. Um, but uh, I think for large viscosity, I don't, I don't know if that works. Um, so in some sense, maybe it's harder. Well, I don't know precisely what the rules for the Millennium Problem are. No, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> so... <laughs> the first statement, you said, if you can prove global exists for order, then you can prove global exists for non -resource. For small viscosity. Only for small viscosity. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, essentially, any time you want to prove something globally in Riemannian geometry, you use compactness one way or the other. Um, and we don't generally have that. We do have some local questions. Um, if you have, so uh, I'm going to show you the criterion for um, which gives you Fred Holmness for diffeomorphism groups. Um, and we understand that for fluids. So that's work um, that I did with uh, David Eben and Gerard Misiolik. Uh, and then we did it for other continuum equations as well um, with Misiolik. Uh, so, in particular, you get this distinction um, where the Fred Holmness, the finitely many conjugate points and nice structure of those conjugate points, works really well in two dimensions and does not work in three dimensions. Um, so, what is a conjugate point? I uh, just want to show you um, intuitively what a conjugate point looks like in the diffeomorphism group. So, here's a, a fluid on S2, the surface of the Earth, for example. Uh, it's a really simple fluid. It's just rigidly rotating the, the sphere. Um, and so then I consider, uh, suppose I perturb all the particles in some direction and I see what happens. So it spins around. It starts out at zero, increases, and then decreases back to zero again. Um, so that's like a stable perturbation of a, a fluid. And let's see if I can stop it. Okay. Um, so in general, you can work out in some special cases, really explicitly where the conjugate points are. Um, so my basic examples are on S2 and S3. Right? S2 it works, S3 it fails. Uh, so you just, oops. Um, so if you look at, uh, you just figure out what this formula does. Um, N has to be at least as large as M. And once N starts growing a little bit, you start, you get forced away from pi. So the, you write down all the points that are of this formula, and they're, they're a discrete subset of uh, pi to infinity. Um, on S3, you get the opposite. You get uh, any conjugate point you could possibly want. Now, you're not going to get conjugate points happening uh, everywhere in an interval, but you can get a, a, they're always countable, but you can get a dense subset. Um, and so here, you actually get the all rational multiples of pi. Um, so notice what's happening here. The reason you um, only go out to pi, so you don't get everything, uh, is essentially because you get nice well-posedness of the differential equation. So what that implies is that the exponential map is um, locally invertible, which means, uh, so starting from zero, there's always going to be some amount of time you can go where you're not getting conjugate points, where your geodesic is minimizing um, up to that point. Once you get beyond there, then you start failing to minimize. And what this is telling you is that there's lots of ways in which you're failing to minimize. Uh, so once you get around to the other side of the... Um, sphere. So, um, so that's essentially how bad it can be. Uh, now, how do you prove Fred Holmness? Um, so essentially, you have to analyze the Jacobi equation. Uh, in general, the Jacobi equation would look like this. You take a, a covariant derivative because you're moving through the manifold. Um, and so you have to work out what the curvature is. Uh, but it's not the most convenient form to look at, um, essentially because the curvature is a mess. Uh, even in the simplest cases, it's still kind of a mess to analyze. Um, and also, you're not really incorporating the group structure. right? So you're not saving anything by looking at right invariant metrics on manifolds. Um, so if you were teaching this, somebody hadn't heard about it before, would you first say, 
Consider the derivative of the exponential math and write it as j of t, and then j of t satisfies that equation above. Uh, Is that the logic? Because I'm not familiar yes. with these equations. Okay. You have the exponential math, and you write it out, and then that's the equation satisfied? Um, yeah, so, so basically it's just linearizing the, the geodesic equation, right? Um, so the geodesic equation is also... What? I want to say this, because you used this word Jacobi equation, so okay. unknown quantity. Okay, so, this, so, the, um, so we're trying to understand the exponential map, which takes uh, an initial velocity to um, a final position, right, if you fix a, a time. So you're going to follow a geodesic starting at this velocity to a final point. So that's some um, rather nonlinear map from a linear space to a, a nonlinear space. Um, and so if we want to try and make sense of it, we want to, um, you know, easiest thing to do is try and just look at its first derivative. What can we say about the first derivative of that map? So yeah, if we, if we just define the derivative of the exponential map, um, which is a map from one tangent space to another tangent space, it's a linear operator. Um, and since the exponential map is defined to be whatever you get by the solution of the geodesic equation, um, essentially to figure it out, you just have to linearize the geodesic equation. And the trick is, because it's on a, a manifold and you don't have nice commutative properties, you'd start with the geodesic equation, which is eta t t equals zero. Linearization of, not, of that is not just j double prime equals zero, it's um, j double prime equals the curvature, because um, derivatives don't commute on a Riemannian manifold. So that's how you, you introduce the, the Jacobi equation. Um, right, and so a Jacobi equation is going to tell you, you work that out, you get a Jacobi field, and the Jacobi field being um, zero at two points is going to tell you about minimizing. So you imagine some geodesic like here, and uh, work out the variation of geodesics uh, through this. So it'll look something like this, and what that tells you is if you were to push the geodesic a little bit in this direction, um, as long as you've got zero here, then you're going to be able to shorten the geodesic um, by going this way. Uh, hmm? You can shorten this geodesic by going this way, so you're not minimizing anymore on this, this space. Um, and that's essentially what it's used for. So I'm going to relate uh, minimizing properties of geodesics to um, some other interesting stuff uh, using this. So that's why you look for for conjugate points, right? So that's um, where you can find any solution of this equation, which is zero at the endpoints. In retrospect, I probably could have defined conjugate points a little earlier. Um, but anyway, so that's conjugate points. Uh, so when you could use this equation directly is if you have um, a nice compact curvature operator. All right, so th if this is compact, then you can say the Jacobi equation, you can write down the solution, you would just ignore this entirely, uh, solve this equation, which is easy, um, and then view the actual solution as a perturbation of that. So compact perturbation, that means it's invertible plus compact, which is what you want for Fredholm. And that only works if this operator, um, fixing eta dot, which is the geodesic tangent vector, uh, this as an operator from j to whatever uh, is compact, which, as I said, works for the free loop space, does not work in general. Um, so what you should do instead is um, use the group structure, incorporate the group structure and the fact that your geodesic equation splits into uh, two decoupled equations, right? This one, the second one doesn't involve eta. Um, and so since that splits, the Jacobi equation, which is just the linearization of the geodesic equation, must also split. So what you have is, um, so you just do standard linearization procedure. Down here, it's really obvious, you just get this. Uh, Z is the perturbation of U. Um, up here, for the flow equation, it's a little bit trickier because uh, you're working on a Lie group and you keep moving things around from one tangent space to another. Um, but you basically get the group adjoint uh, operator, whatever that is. Um, so you can analyze this, and this is actually how I found... This is basically what I've used to find whatever conjugate points I find because these equations are a lot simpler. Um, so you can rewrite this using the definition of the group adjoint. Um, rewrite the first equation this way. The second equation, um, this is, so this is the Jacobi equation, um, which I wrote down here. So essentially it's, um, hmm? Okay, and then next, um, I basically 
Uh, well, I use the fact that this, although it looks like a second order equation, it's actually a first order, it's actually two first order equations. Um, so the relationship between j and y is that j is basically just the um, left translation applied to y. So it's just a, a way of, of rewriting the, this same equation so that I don't have to compute the curvature because it's not helping me anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm just trying to simplify the Jacobi equation, write it in some way where something's going to fall out really simply. Um, so I collect these two terms into this capital add star, which uh, already showed up for the Euler equation, right? Remember that if you don't have this term, you just have this stuff, then this is precisely DDT of add star. So you just get this extra stuff. And what's kind of miraculous about this is that this term simplifies a lot um, because of conservation of vorticity. So you just play around with this um, using the fact that you have uh, adjoints and twist it around, incorporate conservation of vorticity, and it just turns into um, basically this operator, right? So up here, u is dependent on time, w is dependent on time, eta is dependent on time. Down here, eta disappears entirely, uh, and it only depends on the initial, um, the initial condition. And what's happened over here is this is a positive definite operator, add star times add. So now, now you have a chance um, where even if the curvature is not well behaved, this operator has a much better chance of being well behaved. If this thing is compact, again, you can just ignore it, solve this equation, and then view the actual solution as a compact perturbation of that. And so that's precisely how you get Fred home. Um, this thing will be a positive definite operator. To solve it, you just integrate that positive definite thing, which is still positive definite, and that's why it's got to be invertible. Um, so invertible plus compact. Uh, so then you just have to, anyone gives you a infinite dimensional group with some Riemannian metric, you just work out what is this operator, is it compact or not, you get Fred Holmness for free. Um, okay, so why is it different between two and three dimensions for fluids? Uh, you just work it out. So given, you know, so we're looking at this as an operator on W, fixing some U naught. Um, and essentially you just count how many derivatives you have. Uh, so you start with W, um, take an inverse Laplacian, and then a skew gradient of that. Uh, so you're up two and then down one. So you've gained one derivative. Right? And anytime you gain a derivative in some function space, then you've, get, you've got compactness for free. Uh, in 3D, you, instead of just taking an inner product with W, you're taking a Lie bracket with W. So you're losing a derivative here, gaining two, losing one again, and you're back where you started, so you don't get compactness. Um, the one issue here is all this stuff would work out great if um, your Riemannian metric actually generated your topology, right? And then these are the equations you should work with. This is the correct space to work in. That's not true here. Um, Riemannian metric does not generate the topology. So this is essentially going to tell you what's going to happen um, in the geometric space. So this is an equation that makes sense in L2. But L2 is not what we care about. We care about HS because we care about the exponential map, and the exponential map is only defined in HS if your solutions are sufficiently smooth. Uh, okay, I had a lot of coffee just before I came here, so that will be some effort, but I'll try. Um, derivative count. Okay, so you start with W, lose no derivatives from this, gain two derivatives from the inverse Laplacian, um, so you're up two, and then you lose one derivative going here. So you're one smoother than you started with in the 2D case. Uh, in the 3D case, when you take a Lie bracket with, uh, of W with something else, you're losing one derivative, uh, gain two derivatives from the inverse Laplacian, lose one derivative by taking the curl. So back where you started. Is that helpful? OK. Um, so like I said, you'd be done if, uh, if this were the space you cared about, right? If you cared about L2, but you care about C1. And so, um, so then you have to worry about uh, commutator estimates. The commutators work out to be compact. Mostly that works, except in one case, which we have never been able to figure out, um, surfaces with boundaries. So that's still an open problem. Uh, you get Fred Holmness to almost work for 2D fluids on a space with boundary. Um, but the, the commutators, we just couldn't get to work. Um, 
So if it works, so maybe so some people are interested in this. If it ends up working, um, it's not very interesting, unfortunately. Uh, if it doesn't work, then I have no idea why it wouldn't work. So it would be really, really interesting. It would tell you really what the difference is between uh, weak and strong. But I think it's going to work. And so it's not really a good way to sell the problem to someone. Um, but, you know, maybe you could try it if you want. I will certainly never think about it again. I spent too many months. Um, unless it's not true, and then, then I won't care again. Uh, so you can also get a little more structure. Um, so Fred Holmness is one thing. It tells you about conjugate points. Um, so Schneerman also proved, as he mentioned yesterday, um, that it's quasi-ruled, which means allows you to sort of talk about uh, the index theory of this as a nonlinear map. Um, and the reason you'd care is uh, to solve the surjectivity problem, which is um, can you reach any volume-preserving transformation by some geodesic. So can you pick the initial velocity field uh, to send you to some final fluid configuration? And we really don't know. We have no idea whether that's true, even in two dimensions. And in three dimensions, um, this is uh, even harder. And we don't expect anything to help because of Fred Holmness failing. Um, as I mentioned, you can also generalize this to, th to work out any PDE, which has some sort of geodesic interpretation. Um, and so for example, uh, Kamasa Holm equation um, works out to have a nice Fred Holm exponential map uh, for its geodesics. Does it have anything to do with the hopf renault theorem or other you know, things we care about? Uh, we don't really know. Kamasa Holm is you know, fairly well studied, so it's known to have solutions that blow up in finite time. Um, although, if you don't, so remember this is the Euler equation, this is the equation on the Lie algebra. The Lie algebra is not a nice Lie algebra. It loses derivatives when you take Lie brackets, um, which means sometimes you can introduce bad behavior by using the group structure. Right? Sometimes things are well behaved if you look at the geodesic equation on the full group, badly behaved if you try and switch to the Lie algebra. So it doesn't always simplify things. It actually makes things harder. And that's what happens here. Um, you, get, you do have geodesics, which exist for all time, um, but it's they just, uh, when you apply the operation of looking at it on the Lie algebra, uh, then things break down. But they don't break down because they're, because the geodesics are breaking down. Um, so that's, that's what, essentially what we know so far about global existence having anything to do with um, this geometry. Yes. Um, no. Uh, so once you, once you settle on a group structure um, and a type of metric, uh, then you basically get the same R for any dimension. The only time that doesn't work is when you're working on the volume-preserving diffeomorphism group. So this is the one time when you, dimension two is different from, from dimension three. Normally it's the same. So for example... Yes, yeah, so you work out compactness of, of um, this operator. And generally, the operator tends to look the same in any dimension. Uh, it's just exceptional in this, in this one case. Um, no, the add star operator that shows up um, here and works out. So the fact that you get two totally different formulas in, in this case is rare. Uh, normally, it wouldn't depend on the dimension of the underlying manifold. Um, Almost. So the statement is, if you have, um, so the difficulty is you can't say the HR diffeomorphisms. HR is what the metric is. HS is what the diffeomorphism class is. And it's always weak, right? You're, like, you always have R much smaller than the S that you need. You need S large enough so that all your objects are C1. Um, but R should be pretty small so that it describes something physical. So usually R is 0 or 1. S is 3 or 4 or 5. Um, so if, if the metric itself is large enough, uh, the, if you have enough derivatives in your metric somehow, um, then you'll get Fred Holmness. Right. Yeah. 
Um, but I don't like this idea of the audience talking to each other. So you should tell him and he tells me. Or something. Maybe pass me a note. Um, <laughs> after the talk. <laughs> it's just that the uh, volume preserving case, when R is strictly greater than zero, mm -hmm. then it immediately gives the red hot ones. Uh, yeah, so if you, if the, the reason you might care, so the reason you care about R equals zero is because it's L2, that's energy, right? Energy is the integral of the velocity squared. So physically we care about that. Why might you care about R equals one? Um, so generally if you do some sort of averaging process so that you, the heuristic argument for this is you do some averaging process so that you don't care about small scale structures in the, in the fluid, you just look, care about the large scale structures. Um, then R equals one is uh, uh, going to help you there. Once you have R equals one, you pretty much get Fred Holmness for free in, in any diffeomorphism group. Um, so here's an example of something that, that uh, Gerard Misiolek discussed um, last time, the Hunter-Saxton equation. Uh, so what we worked out is the generalization of this for any dimension, right, in terms of the divergence. Uh, but in the one-dimensional case, the simplest case, it looks like this. It's not quite a group. So it's, you have a right invariant metric, but it's degenerate, so it's not really a metric on a group. Um, but all this stuff works out close enough. So you can do this computation, what's the add star operator, and it basically looks like this. Um, this mu is the average of, uh, of this stuff so that the inverse derivative is defined. Um, but you do your derivative counting. Right, so you start with W, you're losing one derivative here, but gaining two derivatives with this. So you get some smoothness and you get fred Um So you should get an, a fred exponential map. And yet, I already gave you an example of um, this, which is not fred right? Because this is, uh, as, as Gerard mentioned, this is the round sphere. It's isometric to the round sphere. And you know the infinite dimensional round sphere can't have a fred exponential map because you start at some... Um, so start at the North Pole, send your geodesic around. Once you get to the South Pole, you get conjugate points in every possible direction, right? And so you have infinite multiplicity of conjugate points. It can't be Fred Holm, um, which seems like a contradiction, except it works out because uh, basically what happens is Fred Holmness does not want to see this infinite multiplicity conjugate point, makes the geodesic equation blow up before you actually reach that point. Um, so it's all fine. But... Uh, but yeah, so as I mentioned, the, the round sphere is not actually as bad as, um, or is not totally disconnected from this diffeomorphism group stuff. Um, okay, so I want to go, so that's some general stuff uh, for geodesic equations um, in any infinite dimensional group. But I want to go back and discuss the 3D case for, um, flu for fluids, uh, because you know, the fact that this technique fails to produce Fred Holmness doesn't mean that Fred Holmness fails, right? So then you want to see, okay, what, how does Fred Holmness fail? Does it, does it fail like uh, on the in, infinite dimensional ellipsoid, or does it fail in some other way? Um, so actually what happens is, the, basically the way you should think of this, if you look at this operator, um, the way I mentioned you, you prove Fred Holmness is you ignore this entirely, because um, it's compact, you solve this part, and then you see what you get. Um, in 3D, since this thing is not compact, you can't ignore it. Um, and so instead, you can just try to approximate it. So um, exactly what kind of operator is it? And the nice thing about this is uh, you can approximate the, those operators really well. So essentially, what's different in 3D is there are more divergence-free fields. And so if you want to try to um, approximate a vector, so so you could ask, you have some vector field on the manifold. Um, well, let's say you don't have the entire vector field. You just have one vector. And you want to approximate that by a vector field. So you can imagine how to do that. You just construct some sort of bump function and, and have it concentrated near that vector and then zero elsewhere. Uh, then you ask, I also want it to be divergence-free. Can I approximate that thing by a divergence-free vector field? Um, and it depends how much room you have. In 2D, you don't have enough room to do that really well. So essentially what you need for this is to do it in two different directions. In 2D, you don't have enough room for that. Uh, in 3D, you do. You have that third direction, which allows you to approximate more things. And so what you do is you approximate this variation field on the entire manifold. So this, 
this vector field where every point is being pushed in some direction. You say, okay, what I really want for the fluid is I want to look at one particle moving around, uh, just perturb that particle, and you know, perturb the other particles nearby just enough so that I can study that and make sure it's divergence free. So it actually represents a fluid perturbation. Um, and so you can do that in 3D. Right? So any perturbation you want of just a single particle, you can approximate by a real perturbation on the entire diffeomorphism group. Uh, which means you're essentially just solving this um, ordinary differential equation uh, along a single Lagrangian path. Um, and so the curvature is still showing up here, but this is not the real curvature on the diffeomorphism group. It's just the curvature on your underlying manifold. Lot, a lot, lot simpler. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the Jacobi... So essentially how you're getting this is... So the reason you can see this, is, this should be the right answer is... Um, well, let's see. Recall, this is the, um, the equ uh, equation satisfied by um, the particles in the fluid. Right? Here, the gradient of the pressure is constructed in such a way so that uh, the fluid is divergence-free. Pretend you didn't have that situation. Pretend instead that the pressure was just some time-dependent function uh, magically handed down so that when you solve Newton's equation, force equals uh, mass times acceleration, um, for this time-varying potential, it just so happens miraculously that everything's volume-preserving. You can imagine that happening. Uh, and hmm? Right, and then it's Euler's equation just for your particular initial velocity. Wouldn't work for anything else. Um, right, but the pressure would have to be handed down based on what the initial velocity is. So if you change the initial velocity at all, Say yes. Um, but that's going to depend on the initial condition. Uh, but suppose we're in that situation, we have this pressure handed down from God, um, and we linearize this equation, so we just consider the variation of a single particle, then that's precisely what we'd get um, just by linearizing this equation point by point. The second form is um, rather more convenient. What's interesting about the second form, all I have to do is... So notice, in the first form, I'm, I'm considering a single particle which is moving. Um, in the second form, I can consider basically not how the particle is moving in space, but the home of the particle, which may be some other manifold. Um, and so essentially, it just involves a left translation. I can imagine that whatever vector I have moving along this curve uh, is just coming from a vector that's moving in a single tangent space and then pushed forward by the flow. And that's how you're getting the second form. Uh, but in the second form, you can see all sorts of things that you actually care about in physics. Um, right? In this first form, we don't really care about the curvature or the, the pressure Hessian. That's kind of a mess. Um, here we care about the vorticity. Omega zero is the initial vorticity of wherever this particle's home was. And over here, we have d eta transpose times d eta. That's the stretching matrix. That's telling you, as you move a fluid, um, essentially what's this positive definite uh, matrix you take three vectors over here, fluid pushes them over here and stretches them in some way, um, and those are two things we really care about, stretching and vorticity, uh, mainly because stretching of vorticity is what is responsible for blow-up. If you have blow-up in the 3D Euler equations, um, then you must have the vorticity going to infinity. Uh, and essentially, so I've written it in this form because vorticity is conserved. So this is the stretching of whatever your initial vorticity vector is. You take the soup over all possible particles, uh, integrate that soup with respect to time, and you get it. if you get infinity, then the fluid must be blowing up. And if this is finite, then the fluid can't possibly blow up um, at time t. So if you think about the things that show up in the Jacobi equation and the things that show up in this um, Beal-Katomida criterion, which actually kind of predates them, um, from a different point of view. Uh, but if you imagine, okay, I'm seeing the same terms, so maybe there's some kind of connection. Um, in order to make that work, uh, 
you kind of have to pull this supremum outside the integral, which is not justified. We have no idea if that's true or not. Um, but if you could pull that soup out of that integral, um, so you could say, if this thing's going to infinity, then I must be able to see it at a single particle, also going to infinity, um, then you can just study blow up of vorticity along some Lagrangian path. And we have tools to study that in terms of conjugate points. So basically what you prove is, um, you just analyze this ODE. Uh, it's pretty simple. This is... Maybe? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, w I would love to, to prove this, because otherwise it's a really ugly assumption I have to make. Um, I can imagine it happening that you can't pull the soup out. I can imagine a situation where that is. But we don't really have a proof one way or the other, unfortunately. Um, but it's a, it's a really simple, it's a three-dimensional ODE. Um, this is constant, so you can even pull a time derivative out entirely. Uh, and in fact, you don't, don't even have to worry about the vorticity direction. All the action's happening perpendicular to the vorticity direction, so it's really just a 2D equation. So you can analyze it fairly concretely in terms of you know, when do you have zeros um, on two sides. Uh, and so basically you can say, use this technique. If you say the vorticity is blowing up, then you can get some uh, conjugate point locations um, that are approaching the blow-up time. So what you're going to see is, uh, in your fluid, so you represent your fluid as a geodesic in this infinite dimensional space. And let's say the blow-up time is here. All right. So what's going to happen is you're going to see some sequence of times. And these little bumps, um, each one of these will be just like that. It'll be a direction in which you can shorten the geodesic. So you, your geodesic can't be minimizing on any of these time intervals um, as you approach all the way out. Which, so the nice thing about that is, um, well, you can't do anything with it yet. But the nice thing about it is you can, uh, it's just purely geometric, right? The difficulty we keep having is that we're working with a weak Riemannian metric, L2, um, and yet we need everything to be at least C1 to get like nice existence and such. Um, and that's precisely why you have something like Bill Cato Mida, because uh, it's, it's somehow giving you some C1 control that you need for your solutions to work out. Um, but the only thing we can control geometrically is stuff that involves the weak L2 metric. Uh, but this is something we can see in the weak L2 space. We have some idea of what the geometry of these volume-preserving maps looks like um, in L2. It's not a nice manifold, but it's something, some space. Uh, and we can see this, anything that's like blow up, we can see it already happening there. Um, so I have some hope that maybe you could do something with that. It doesn't exactly work. Um, it w mostly works, but you have, basically you'd say a typical situation would work. Uh, there is some exceptional situation where it doesn't work, but then you can characterize that fairly concretely. Um, so that's, yeah, that's essentially what I care about. Can you, can you understand blow up, um, understanding this geometry better? Uh, and so the real question, yes? Can you back up why you brought the conclusion to the previous slide? Yes. Um, so you can study blow up in terms of the conjugate points. You can prove the existence of these conjugate points uh, as long as a certain condition is not satisfied. Right? And so the generic situation is that you have all these conjugate points. The special situation is um, basically that you can say something about the stretching matrix uh, and its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. They must stop moving, essentially. Yes. Um, okay. So, yeah. And essentially, what, what one wants to do with this um, is just to get some better understanding of this infinite dimensional geometry, where things tend to, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, pretty much everything fails when you try to do infinite dimensional versions of finite dimensional stuff. Right, and so you always have to force something in. Like here, I had to force in compactness in order to get Fred Holmness. Um, and generally, you need, to, you need to throw extra stuff in. Um, so we don't have a great understanding of infinite dimensional manifolds and how various things can break down. And especially, what we really need 
is some kind of connection between when this thing breaks down, this thing also breaks down in infinite dimensions. And we have some models where we can see those things happening, but we don't really have direct relationships between them. So we basically need some other kinds of models of this geometric situation. Um, for me, what I'm most interested in is approximations that would preserve the geometry somehow. Um, so, uh, so you can imagine, say, just particles um, constrained to move as geodesics. And instead of saying that if I take any arbitrary volume in my fluid, uh, that volume will be conserved, maybe I just measure finitely many volumes and say that those are forced to be conserved, and then I have some finite dimensional situation. Um, and I can see if, if that's telling me anything for this. Um, or you can imagine, uh, say, in, instead of volumes, um, preserving integrals of functions because the change of variables in an integral is precisely the Jacobian determinant of the, the, um, the transformation. So if you integrate uh, any function against your diffeomorphism and that's preserved, then you must be volume preserving. So maybe instead of integrating any possible function, you're just integrating finitely many functions. The difficulty is uh, when you try to, to preserve the geometry, uh, you start losing the algebra structure. So there's no way to imagine these things having some sort of group structure. Uh, those things will break down. You can also try and approximate the group structure, but then you start losing the, the geometry. And I think the, the geometry is telling you something. So, so what we really need is, is something that would preserve both structures somehow. That's all I have. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. Very, very small minor comment. If you go back to the previous slide, Okay, the history is that the vorticity has really a physical circumstance of signification for people doing free, so that might make this criteria very popular. But if you just replace that by the stretching matrix, it's also true, and you have a simple proof. And in fact, it was done before the contrast. Oh, I remember there, there was some. Can you paraphrase what was said? I didn't. Yeah, so, so the. So, so the TN with it will be the eigenvalue of the stretching uh, matrix. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so I've, I've seen a proof in terms of the deformation tensor, but not directly in terms of the. Tensor, yeah. yeah um, so, so the deformation tensor, right. Right, so the deformation tensor is basically the derivative of the stretching matrix. Yeah. Uh, and the comment was that um, this is popular because you can see it numerically. Right? People tend to measure the vorticity, um, but it's not the only one you can do. And you can. You can also prove that if you have some other type of C1 control, like on the deformation tensor, you can also um, use that as your criteria. Uh, well, that's related to my question. I mean, uh, I can imagine the one definition blow up is you, you think something goes to infinity or something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> so it's very close to your mouth. But I was thinking. If you use the definition of blow up, just kind of more intrinsic, namely, blow up means that you've left the space where you can solve the initial value of the problem uniquely. I mean, like if, you have, if you're in a, you know, a half a derivative in L2 or something, I think if you solve other equations, maybe it's a small time. So something like that. So, even, so not, maybe not smooth. I mean, so the question is, what is what's the best definition of what do you, what, when you say blow up, what are you actually using? Are you using this sort of failure of equation that breaks down or just it's not smooth anymore in some sense? Um, depends what you care about. For what, for what I care about, which is more the geometry, then I'll say like, anything you can do to extend the solution is um, avoiding blow up. Right? So I, what? I say if you can extend this, if you can find any way of making sense of the solution, then you've avoided blow up. Um, That's what I would say. So I would say the, what you're going to see here is, um, and this is related to the metric completion uh, of the space in L2, uh, which as I mentioned Sherman worked on. Um, so we have some understanding. So because energy is conserved for these solutions, um, you have this, this uh, uh, finiteness of L2. So L2 is always bounded. Um, so if you, if you understand how the space is behaving metrically with respect to the L2 metric, um, then you can imagine you've got this smooth, here's how I imagine it. 
Um, you've got the smooth space, and then on the boundary of that space, you've got this very rough stuff, the, the L2 volume-preserving maps, which aren't, don't correspond to diffeomorphisms. Um, but you imagine that uh, although those things are invisible, when you just work with the smooth structure, they're actually there in the L2 structure. So a geodesic is starting in the smooth part and then like, hitting that, that rough stuff as the, the boundary. Um, so I, that, that's where I would expect to see something going wrong. Um, so I want to see that transition into, into this, this broader space. Any other questions besides this? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Like the swing. <laughs> well, when you're computing the adjoint, uh, you wanted it to be compact. But uh, if it happens to be, for example, just spread hall with some control on the variable part, is there something you can do with it? Possibly. I haven't seen that happen in, in any situation. Um, so, so I don't know. So the, uh, we, there are some cases where we have, so as I said, in 3D fluids, we know that operator is not compact, and you know, there's nothing else to compensate for it. Because we know it must fail to be thread home, because um, you can find all these conjugate points. Uh, in other cases, I, I really have no idea. Um, it certainly seems possible that if it's, say, failing to be compact, but you have some control over which directions it fails, then maybe you can make something work. Um, but I don't know the situation where that happens. So, so this is a question about Sherman's result. It says the, the uh, completion of volume preserving diffeomorphisms in the L2 metric is the set of all measure volume measure preserving projects onto the map. So that's a group, and it's a metric. I don't. Um, you should ask him, but I, I don't know if it's uh, bijections. Um, so you. Just because you're measure preserving doesn't mean you can actually prove that it, it must be one to one. What's the statement? Um, that I think it's just measure preserving maps. So you so you might I fail to be a bijection on a set of measure zero. Right, right. So that you don't necessarily have that group structure. So it's, it's a semi group. So it's a metric space and it's a semi group. So can you study the geometry of that space? I would hope so, but I, I didn't ask. I didn't realize it was not okay. Can I have another comment, David? I have another short, short comment. Uh, it's about, okay, it's about singularity. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, let's say if you deal with finite dimensional and dynamical systems, instability is characterized by the fact that something grows exponentially. Do you agree with that? Now you take the Euler equation in 2D which I found is well controlled at this thing here. And you try to look at the stability in some settings, so the instability, or let's say how uh, the irregularity may go with time. There is, only, for smooth initial data, there is only one estimate which is due to Bollinger, and which says that you can estimate it by a double exponential, exponential and exponential KD. And this has never been improved. That means that in some sense, you already know that you may have even to the thing that behave very badly and with a computer and experiment, making the difference between something that is infinite and something that is exponential of exponential KT may not be easy. Any other questions? I would change the last comment to say, not that we know that it behaves there very badly, but we, we do not know that it doesn't behave very a, it's a lack of information, really, in, uh, from the other uh, bullet in estimate. Mm -hmm. This one? Is that right? Even more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other questions and comments? Well, let's thank the speaker again. Yeah.